it was the last day of the season, wasn't it? It was already over by the shouting at the top end before uh, we got into the last day. I was super confident Arsenal were going to not bottle it. And then obviously they bottled it and they bottled it in probably the worst way imaginable. Which, you know, on the one hand, I worry for the future of a lot of those players. It's a very young team. Arteta's a very young manager. Um, when you've been front runners in the Premier League for so long, it was their, definitely their title to lose. And they were playing great football right up until the end. You know, the injury to Saliba was critical in the end and obviously as well and i do want to hark back to what i said pre-world cup which was one team at the top end is going to get an injury and it's going to affect them i think it's fair to say now with the benefit of hindsight yes and ketia did a great job but jesus was not the same player when he when he got back in the team it was a big injury he came back I uh, just didn't have the same cutting edge, and it made things difficult. The midfield was still incredible. I think Odegaard, uh, Martinelli, and Saka all finished on very similar goal tallies, like you know, double figures. Lots to like, but very lightweight in defence. Probably some mistakes started creeping in to Ramsdale's game at the end, but whatever. And ultimately. Just a bridge too far. I think, you know, obviously, you take second place if you're Arsenal. You say, yeah, we 100% want that. But unfortunately, they were first for... It was something like 264 days out of the season. It was something mental like that. I think, like, Man City had it for 60 days or something. And they were, like, top for, like, the rest of the time. So, it's one of those where it's, like, for me, as a Newcastle fan, I don't mind because we had the biggest bottle of all time. Uh, in with the twelve point lead, so I'm I'm perfectly fine with that being the new benchmark of what bottling looks like in the prem. <laughs> Having Newcastle hold on and get top four, how do I feel about it? I'm a little bit apprehensive, honestly. I did wonder whether or not we could do it. I thought we might drop to fifth or sixth in. A uh, twelve point lead. Twelve point lead. Newcastle gave up a twelve point lead. Ninety five, ninety six. We we threw a twelve point lead with something like eight games to go. It's, it's the biggest choke ever. You know, so I was a little bit worried, but I also do think maybe we are good value for fourth because Chelsea had a nightmare and Tottenham had a nightmare and you know, blah blah blah. Uh for me it just seems like we really need a lot of personnel. Uh, if we're going to truly compete in the Champions League. And I know Eddie Howe's been very bullish on he doesn't want to make those signings. And so, oh, listen, I'm all right. I'm fine with that, brother. But the reality is we're going to need someone. We're going to need some quality. We're going to need probably another striker. We're definitely going to need another defender. We, we, like, Cher can't keep getting in this team. He's a fucking disgrace. Like, I despise that player like there was a group of players that sort of came in and established themselves as regulars but they're not fit to wear the shirt lascelles was one share was one like fuck these bums they got no job they had no job wearing a fucking newcastle shirt at all they're absolute scumbags and share is good for a fucking mistake a goal risking mistake at least once a game he'll always have a shot from distance Okay, well done, you scored that one. Who gives a fuck? I just can't stand him, and I, 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 he's got to be gone. If Cher's getting into your team, you are not a Champions League calibre team. And we certainly need uh, to add something in the midfield, because best will in the world, Joe Linton is all effort. I've grown to like him, which I didn't think was possible, because I used to despise him. I would have had him put in prison for crimes against football if I'd had my way. But effort and tenaciousness, it goes a long way. Fine for the Premier League. Fine for a game against Leeds. If we ever end up playing any of the big boys in Europe, like he's going to get found out. He's going to get yellow carded in the first 10 minutes, red carded by 40. He's going to be off the pace. He is, again, the real talk is he's not polished enough for the Champions League yet. Bruno needs some help in there in the centre. And keep in mind, we're still playing Willock because St. Maximan got found out, really. So overall, like, yeah, maybe we were the fourth best team this season. Champions League, we got lots to lots to think about. And I think I'll just want to talk about Ten Hag. Because I cannot believe the media when it comes to Ten Hag. I'm 
really don't know what's going on. But like, even like United fans, we should demand more from Ten Hag, or Ten Hag should have done more this season. He finished third with one of the worst United squads in my lifetime, unquestionably. So thin on quality, so poor. And he took them to third and won a trophy. And basically, it could have gone better for them in Europe, but Harry Maguire happened again. One of the supplementals I'm going to do is Harry Maguire, the story at the club. Ah, fuck it, I'll just fold it into this. But the story at the club is that, like, they're offering him 10 million to fuck off, which is like that fucking meme. I'm going to pay you 10 million to fuck off. Like, I mean, imagine that. I'm at, like the most expensive defender in the world. And I saw a stat, I think it's on, um, I think it's called Instastat or iStat or something. But basically, like the season before this season, he was responsible for 16 errors that led to goals. And obviously, they're a notoriously harsh fucking website for that type of thing. But that's like, Harry Maguire is a joke. He's a joke of a player. And when he came in, what he did in that severe tie is unforgivable. Any team that is one injury away from Harry Maguire being back in the squad, you get Champions League with that. I think Ten Hag's done a fucking miracle work around that. Uh, like, it's actually insane. You know, he had the Ronaldo problem to deal with. They don't really have a striker. And, like, Rashford's not a striker. You know, he plays in the left channel. They got He got career best form out of Rashford. Uh, the other choices for striker were, like, Martial. Dog shit, can't stay fit, doesn't work. They bring in Veghorst. Everyone said it was a meme. I said he'd score goals, important goals. He didn't. Didn't score a single goal, in fact. Uh, so I'll take the L on that one. But I thought he did play well, and Man United looked better when he was playing. And if it was me, I'd still be picking him over Martial, even if he never scored. Never got a goal. I think, like, Malassia, not good enough. And you look at what he's done. Uh, De Gea's gone. I mean, like, De Gea was responsible. He made something like three uh, fucking goal errors and just looked like, I mean... It, just embarrassing, embarrassing in the FA Cup final as well. Like, De Gea's gone. Ten Hag didn't want him from the start and is looking to replace him. Jordan Pickford would have been favourite to go had Everton gone down. That didn't happen. So it's uh, it's interesting, but it's a rebuild season, and obviously Ten Hag doesn't know what he can spend, what he can't spend, because so we've got this ownership thing looming over him. You know, are the Qataris coming in? Is it going to be some Americans? Is it going to be neither? Is it going to be the, the Glazers going to stick around and give him no money? And then is it another fucking more veg hosts coming in? So it's really, really tough, and I think third and back into the champions league i think that's unreal and a trophy to boot and an fa cup final which you know certain players let the club down on that day although i will just add and then this is prem review and not fa cup review i will add casemiro was very lucky that he didn't get a red and not only did he not get a red somehow the ref the standard of ref in uh, again in english football somehow he got the foul for doing an over the to over the top of the ball ankle breaking leg breaking challenge and he got a free kick to him so you know swings and roundabouts i don't think the ref covered himself in glory in the fa cup final but city were worthy winners and city bossed the league once they got uh, once they got their noses in front so right that's that uh, but let's talk about the interesting part, the fucking bottom end uh, of the table. Villa obviously had, like, a pretty good run towards the end of the season. I think Villa were kind of, like, you know, Im imperious in their run, but it just sort of wasn't good enough. Like, if you look at the uh, overall finish uh, that they had, uh, obviously, like, getting up to seventh, finishing above Spurs, finishing above Brentford... Uh, hell of a run right at the end when it mattered and the big takeaway for me is that's the story of the season for me Brighton and Hove Albion getting into uh, Europe I'm super happy you know after Potter left it would have been easy for it to come off the rails De Zerbi fucking kept them focused and yeah they had some stinking results but they're a good club they're well run they got great personnel they're developing talent all that stuff they play great football it's really really good stuff that they're in europe and gonna make some money and i hope that they're able to hold on to some of their better players because obviously caicedo's being linked to chelsea again chelsea buying midfielders stop me if you've heard this one before but that's like that's one of the better things to happen this season 
Brentford obviously fell away at the end. I think Ivan Tony really let the club down in a big way. And it's not a particularly popular opinion, but I think Ivan Tony, uh, what he did with the gambling offences, remember it was something like 242 or whatever the fuck it was, gambling offences. The club have turned it around and said that he was an addict and that the league should do more. And actually what we need to do is ban gambling sponsorships and that would really help. Like, at the end of the day, I get it. Addictions can make you do crazy things. But the bottom line is, like, there has to be some personal accountability somewhere in it. He's in a position where he can get the help he needs. He's not some dude, like, smashing his child's piggy bank open in the middle of the night to get, like, five pound in coppers out so he can put it in a fruit machine, chasing the, the big winner. This is a guy who's got access to, like, nutritionists, physiotherapists, sports psychologists. He's got a club who you know he's the star player he's got a manager he's got a great relationship with he's got people around him and he can get the help and i'm i'm not but i gotta be honest i'm not really buying the angle a gambling addict for me in football is someone like keith gillespie keith gillespie fucking pissed all his money away you know played at united played at newcastle form fucking fell to shit and keith gillespie like got hardly any fucking money now you know, like, that guy didn't get help. That guy did slip through the cracks. That was back when there weren't as robust protections and, you know, protocols to flag him. And, yeah, you know, Carves, right, in the chat, I remember a story when, get this, Paul Merson was a recovering cocaine, alcohol, and gambling addict. Like, he had them all, you know? And when Paul Merson went to Middlesbrough, which was like, remember, this is the club that was being run by Brian Robson, a fucking big drinker, you know, had all the Middlesbrough drinking culture there, Gascoigne turned up. I mean, you can imagine, this is a fucking nightmare. Well, Paul Merson had just been doing his tour, talking about how he was back, and he was feeling better, and he was looking forward to playing at Middlesbrough and having a new start in his career. And in the dressing room, he opened his fucking locker and they'd put a fucking racing guide, like a form guide, in his fucking locker with betting slips and stuff. You know, that's how fucking mad it was at fucking Middlesbrough. So, you know, listen, some people just didn't take it seriously back in the day. But Ivan Tony, he did a tweet and he said, like, I'm going to I'm gonna talk and I'm going to talk unfettered and I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you straight and all this stuff. And it's like, mate, we know, like, you just fucking gambled, gambled, you shouldn't have done it. You got eight months. The FA waited until the end of the season. It's going to hurt the team as little as it can. It's going to hurt you as little as it can. It's fucking crazy to me. So, I don't know. Like, uh, Brentford have been mega supportive and saying it's actually the league's fault and the FA's fault and gambling fault. Like, he's let them down in a big way at a time when Brentford could have easily been where Brighton were. So, there's that. Tottenham. Do you have to dunk on Tottenham at this point? What a fucking insane capitulation. What a nightmare season they've had. And I can't believe the headlines I'm hearing. I cannot believe that Harry Kane is going to stick around. I can't believe it. But that's what's being said. First, it was Harry Kane's going to go and replace Benzema at Real Madrid. That was, like, talked about for ages. No clue if that's fucking true. But, like, now, like, as of the time of recording this, Harry Kane to open up talks with Levy and State Spurs, like... What a bum, like, if he does that, like, zero ambition in his career. You're not even going to be playing in the fucking Europa Conference, like, what are you doing? Like, the natural move for me, if he wants to keep being Mr. England and breaking all the records in the Prem and blah, 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 and why wouldn't he, right? He's hashtag not my striker. I don't think he's a patch on vintage Shearer or whatever, but, you know, I get it. Harry Kane, we all love him. We've, he's one of our own, uh, etc. But the the move to United is the fucking natural one for him. You go to United, they get their striker, they get their talismanic player, and he probably p is, picks up, you know, between now and the end of his career, like three trophies, maybe. Maybe. It's too much to dream for a league, but certainly he'd be playing Champions League football on the reg, and that's all you really need. And so, have that, right? Like, uh, Harry Kane, no, no no, problem. Go to United. If he stays at Tottenham, he's a bum. And anyway, Tottenham, what they did this season is shocking to me. It's actually shocking how poor they were uh, down, the, down the home straight. Not as poor as Chelsea. Uh, Pochettino comes in, insane rebuild, the likes of which I've never seen. And the headline coming in, 12 players out 
including Jao Felix, who they extended to stay. Pock's just coming in and he's cleaning decks and it includes some of the signings that were made in the in the Bowley era. So I don't get that. I don't know why the fuck. Uh, Chelsea's a mess. And actually, low-key, I think Pock's got one of the hardest jobs in that league. Like, I think Bowley's a nightmare. I think he's the boss I wouldn't want to work for. They put a press release out saying he's going to be less involved with the club. I know that cunt. His, his piggy little face. I know exactly who he is. He's going to be sticking his finger in the fucking gumbo nonstop. Like, Chelsea is a toy to him. All the things that people say about the Oilers when they buy a football club, it applies ten times to this Todd Bowley guy. He's, he's a fucking tourist. He wants to be front and centre on it. And I think, like, Pochettino's got a nightmare coming. They're going to spend more money. Let's talk about N'Golo Kante going out. I mean, Kante is getting old. I still think he was the best thing about Chelsea's midfield, probably, in that if all the games they lost under Fat Frank, who, sh again, his stewardship, what a joke, that he gets to have another job. But Kante might be going to Saudi for fucking 100 mil in salary. It's bonkers. But, like, Chelsea finishing 12th, is an embarrassment. It's one of the biggest embarrassments I've ever after spending six hundred million. It's probably the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen in the Premier League. It's hard to think of something that's worse than that. Worth shout outs to Bournemouth. Worth shout out to Forest. Bournemouth especially. As you'll see in a moment, we had them down at the bottom uh, of the league with my predictions they look terrible under parker they look desperately bad i mean like nine nil against liverpool a liverpool that finished fifth and were struggling for large parts of the season there was like no fight in them and then under o'neill they transformed they looked like they were slipping but they pulled it out right at the end of the season with some great wins and you know forrest did the same I think Forest play terrible football, and I think next season they are going to get got. But obviously at the bottom, I think we lose two clubs, where I'm a little bit sad, actually, to see Leeds go down. You know, appointing Allardyce was just utter defeat, utter desperation. I think Allardyce, is, he left as well. He had four games and left. See what I mean about that guy? He's such a fat prick. He's never there for the real shit. Like, he didn't fancy a child. Like, he's 68. He's not doing anything. He said he's as good as anyone in, in the game. He's as good as Pep, good as Arteta. Do you fancy a rebuild in the championship then and get us promoted? Nah, he ain't down for that, actually. Not, not for all the tea in China. Not for all the money you offer me. I'm not going to do it because, you know, I like putting out this fantasy that I was actually a good, competent manager because he had a half-decent run with Bolton because I figured out you could just kick the ever-loving shit out of footballing teams in the Premier League at that time and those teams didn't get that protection. It's an absolute joke. So, Leeds going down. I knew it was bad. I said when they appointed Allardyce, it was just, you're just waving the white flag. You're out of ideas. And it's sad. they got a good young team. Uh, you have to wonder what's going to happen to some of those players. Like, is, you know, Gnonto, Sinistera, Adams. It, it's like that side is going to get fucking picked apart. And yeah, at the end, all that's going to be left is fucking Bamford. Vietnamford fully traumatised the full season in the championship, no doubt. Probably not even getting 20 goals because he's just shot to pieces. So it's crazy, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, Leeds had to stay up this season. I really thought they would do it. I thought, that, I thought Forrest would be where they are and it just hasn't happened like that and then Leicester it's a tragedy it's it, it's a real tragedy it's it's the one for me where I feel sorry for the club and I feel sorry for the fans I actually feel sorry for the owners they stuck with Rodgers for too long it was never going to work with Rodgers he's a he's a fraud uh, and they'd hit the fraudulent point of his career where he's found out and the players don't want to play for him but the thing that really sickened me is it's not just that Rodgers was a fraud and they couldn't afford to fire him it's that the players fucking down tools and visibly so and it's like look best will in the world you can bring vardy on and vardy will run for you he can't hit a cow's ass with a banjo these days so it's all academic like vardy he might bang in 20 goals in the championship but he's lost that half he's lost that step you know he's lost that sharpness for the prem just not gonna work for him and he's 36 
you know, what do you want? And he's still getting a game for you. They never really moved on from that. And they never really had players that you could rely on. And then the ones that you were meant to be relying on, like Telemans, man. Like, what the fuck has gone on there? You've got Telemans and Madison in your midfield, and you're getting relegated. Really, really sad what happened to Leicester. And it happens at all the time with teams that get relegated. The players move on like it weren't their fault. And Telemans is going to be in a big club, and Madison's going to be in a big club. They're just going to walk in like you know, top six teams, or go abroad, get to do whatever they want, and they're going to pretend that they, you know, they had nothing to do uh, with Leicester, and I watched, I watched a lot of Leicester this season, and in particular at the end, I watched the Leicester-Everton game, which was a comedy, it was a comedic game, 2-2 two -two draw, absolute comedy, missed penalties, fucking just, in, in, just an embarrassment, uh, you know, Calvert-Lewin, just a clown, for it, it was it was comedy none of the football was good it was, but it was end to end it was a classic prem game it was up tempo the atmosphere in that stadium you would have thought like like put it this way we obviously just saw a milan derby semi-final in the champions league i am telling you if i was to play you audio from Le leicester city everton at leicester and from the fucking San Siro, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. The atmosphere was insane. The fans backed that Leicester team right until the bitter end. So unfortunately, the fans deserve better. It's just fucking so crazy that the the players just couldn't find like a, an inch. They couldn't find just that extra fucking, you know, extra energy just to stay up. And Everton did it. I mean, classic Decore, the player that I slagged off and said was lazy. He put he pulls out the goal that keeps Everton in the league and it, in a one nil performance. Classic Dice Brexit ball, like I said. But man, I got to be honest, I I was thinking Everton were down. I thought Leicester were going to be the ones that would turn the corner on the last day of the season. Leeds felt, as I said, with Allardyce, they felt defeated to me. But it, and it could have been. It could have been just as easy. It been them. Everton have got a huge rebuild on, and they're going to struggle to keep hold of some of their players. Not that many people want many of their players, but in particular, you know, Pickford's been linked with United. If they'd gone down, it was a shoe, and he was going to move. Who knows now? But yeah, Dyche is already looking at players that can play his system, and that's that. So that was the league. What we'll do now is we'll see how far off. I was brought up my video here. This was the league that uh, I predicted. Let's see how I did. Now, I want to say in my defense, it was a catastrophically, <laughs> a catastrophically unpredictable Premier League season, right? I do want to, I do want to point that out. I think most people's predictions were so far from reality. I don't think mine is that bad. But let's have a look. So, I had Liverpool winning the title. I severely, severely underestimated the problems Liverpool were having with their midfield rebuild. I did not fucking understand the sheer magnitude of that problem. And it got worse after the World Cup. Like, Henderson looks fucking dead inside and out Milner was still looking like one of the more dynamic players they went out and bought strikers they were trying to bed in they had problems at the back I don't give a fuck Trent's still a nightmare for me and I was just watching it thinking I was watching the season unfold thinking okay they've had a loss they've had a loss they've had a loss but that you watch them you know what Liverpool are like they just kill you before they just kill you before oh they've lost again it doesn't matter it's fine you know, there was talk about Klopp going a nightmare. But I knew a third into the season that not only were Liverpool not winning the league, that top four was going to be a struggle. And you can go and watch all of the vids. I was like, listen, they've done me there. Like, I always have a soft spot for Anfield. I can't help it. Like, so they got me. They put me right in the blind spot. Next up, City. Second. Obviously won the league. They should have been second. But Arsenal bottled it. I do want to point out, I put Arsenal third, and what I said was, and this is, this is a W, I uh, said Arsenal are genuine title contenders this season. By the way, no one was saying this when, when I said it. I said, you watch them. The former last season, the players they've got, Odegaard, captain, blah, blah. 
listed it all off. I said, here's who's joining. They're going to be fucking legit title contenders, but they'll fall away at the end because their squad's thin. And that did happen. It just obviously didn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen. So Arsenal uh, finishing third. I'll take that as a W uh, personally because nobody, people were saying they were going to struggle to get in the top four and other stupid nonsense spurs can lick my arsehole from now until the end of time because it is absolutely criminal that with a manager like conte who's got to shoulder some of the blame yes as we're going to get to it's criminal that with the squad they've got with some of the players they've got that they weren't legitimately challenging for top four it should have been well like chelsea falling off liverpool falling off it's the freest top four of your life all you have to do is not be garbage and tottenham couldn't handle that and it all comes down to their midfield i said this the, the worst signing this season but one of the worst signings of premier league history rich Allison for 70 mil tottenham never needed him I don't know why. You certainly didn't need him at 70 mil. And you could have rebuilt your midfield with the 70 mil. You could have got two world-class signings in there. And I wouldn't have to watch fucking Heuberg pretend he's Roy Keane. An absolute joke. Tottenham, yeah. I mean, like, they should have had four. They should have. They finished eight. Crazy. Chelsea at fifth. Now, they finished 12th. <laughs> no one saw that coming again. No one saw. In fact, when I had Chelsea at fifth, I said, they're not going to get top four this season. And everyone went, Richard's wrong. Chelsea, you're going to be sick. You'll see. Two Kel forever. And I'm like going, they're brittle at the back. They concede. They got problems. They got problems defensively. And, and Kante's out and they're not getting protection in the midfield. Again, you can go and watch the tape. Pull it up, Jamie. I said these things. Now, can I predict that Bowley's going to come in? Buy every midfield in the world. Zero fucking strikers. Fire Tuchel. Bring in Potter. Fire him. Bring in Lampard. Like, I can't predict these things, guys. Like, I, I can't predict. Nobody should be expected to predict. That, that, like, if that happened in your football manager game, you would delete the save. You would say the game's broken. I, I'm, I'm, I can't play on that patch anymore. If the way Chelsea was run was happening in a game of football manager, you would... You would only you do a reinstall. You you couldn't you couldn't conceive of it. You couldn't conceive that a game could be that broken. But it's real life. It's real life, dickheads. Don't put that on me. Chelsea fifth. That was a pull. That was uh, them finishing outside of the top four was a pull. Like for sure. Now I'll take the uh, I'll take a massive L on on West Ham. I'll take a massive L on West Ham. Right. I don't know what it is. Uh, uh, it's Antonio. He's so big and strong. Just want him to hold me in his arms. I just thought it was going to be perfect. Like, I really thought it was going to be perfect. Uh, but it, it's it's just not. Um, it just did not. Uh, the, their team... Ben Rama's great. Like it just it just should be better than what it is. They'd finished like what was it, fifth, sixth the season before, you know, they're in Europe. It's mad, like it's mad, it's mad. I don't get it. They should have been better. Like mid table at least. Well, I'd take the L on West Ham. I don't know what the fuck I was smoking. I, I I don't know. It's not even like I like Moyes. Like I don't even think he's good. But whatever. Then I had Manu at seventh. Now, first of all, I do want to stress I pull it up, watch, pull up the tape. I did say that, that it could even be worse for them because the squad they've got is bad, and I stand by that. I think Ten Hag has done a fucking miracle. And the idea that they finished seventh, in my mind, was contingent on the fact they were going to laboriously plow through the season with Harry Maguire at the back and Cristiano Ronaldo up front because the squad didn't seem to have a lot of options. Now, obviously, they finished third and got top four, but nobody thought they could get top four. So it's academic, really, like putting them seventh. The, the surprise is they're in the top four. It's an L. It's not a big L. And then, of course, obviously, didn't even back my own club because I'm so much of a fucking realist. And uh, you can see I had Newcastle at eighth, which, keep in mind, the season before this, we've been battling for relegation under Steve Bruce. The idea that we're finishing top four, I mean, I'd have took eighth. I'd have, I'd have, I'd have eaten a bacon sandwich out of an ashtray for eighth. You know, like, it was, it was like, there's no, it's mad. It's mad what happened. Like, Eddie Howe's got to be up for manager of the year, like, 100%. It's crazy to me. Like, I know, obviously, if Pep gets the, 
the treble, but then it's like it's comparative. It's like you know, Man City do need to get a Champions League under their belt at some point, don't they? Like the money they've spent and all that. So, but to take Newcastle to a Champions League with the squad that we had, and it's still not an amazing squad. I mean, like obviously we've got some players that have been really well scouted and done well, but yeah, like. Top four for us is fucking crazy. Then I had Brighton at ninth. They finished seventh. Sixth. That's not too bad. I didn't back out. Basically, I should have put them where West Ham was in retrospect. I, I slept on Brighton a little bit. Wolves at 10th. And they finished 13th. So it's mid-table, you know. Palace at 11th. And that is indeed a W. That's spot on. Can't argue with that. Then Leicester. Oh my me. If only they had finished 12th. They shouldn't have got relegated. I mean, there's no way. But they did. And then Villa at 13th. Obviously finished 7th. That, again, was contingent on Stevie G having a job. I was probably being generous because under Stevie G, they looked absolutely fucking clueless. And Emery's just transformed them. Brentford at 14th. Yeah, I mean, definitely slept on them. They finished ninth. I think a lot of people probably slept on Brentford. And then Leeds at 15th. You know, I said they were going to have a tough season. I didn't predict them getting relegated. Southampton, I said they could get sucked into the relegation battle. I didn't think Southampton were going to be that bad. 16th. Fulham's probably the biggest disparity. Because Fulham finished 10th. And I had them at 17, just above the relegation battle. Which, again, for a team that's been promoted, I didn't think Mitrovic would carry a scoring form. You know, I didn't think they'd be as good as they were defensively, etc., etc. So, like, maybe I've had a tendency to underestimate championship teams here, as you can see. I had Forrest getting relegated. I uh, had them at 18th. Um, they finished 16th. Everton, I said, this is definitely the season they go down. They had them 19th. They finished 17th. Also contingent on them. I didn't know they were going to go out and get Sean Dyche. I need a hero. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't know about that. And then, obviously, everyone in the world had Bournemouth 20, 20th. Like, everyone did. So And they finished 15th. So, you know. Overall, it wasn't great. <laughs> it wasn't great. Okay, it wasn't like these were not prescient predictions. Clearly, I have a handle on mid-table more than anything else. Although, I don't think my relegation picks are that bad. They were all within, like, two spots, you know, apart from, obviously, Bournemouth, which within five. And I'm, I've got to be excused for Bournemouth. Where it really went wrong is, obviously, in the fucking top six. That's a nightmare. <laughs> He's had a nightmare there. So you need to pay more attention, I guess, and stop being fooled. I'm like, I'm like an England manager. Just get fooled by reputations. But yeah, overall, not a bad season. Now, I will say as well, since these are the, uh, this this is the officially the last Prem review of the season. I'm going to keep my hand in with the Prem review, but I'm not going to lie. As you probably saw the demand for doing a weekly fucking podcast covering all of the events for like 8,000 views it was like, wow, this is a lot of work and a lot of time consumed for not a lot of much. Which, by the way, I know all the people who love the Prem Review and, and I'm glad you supported it. So I'll probably continue it, but I don't know if I can ever go weekly again because that was like, with everything else I'm doing, that was like way too much. But we'll just see, I guess. We'll do, uh, we'll do what we have to do. Uh, we didn't do the phone-in on the last day of the season either, which I really, 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 really wanted to do. But then, obviously, time just slips away from you. Like, it's fucking June, guys. It is June in 2023. Do you, mem do you remember when you were running around your house like a blue-arsed fly trying to get the Christmas dinner ready? It's fucking June, guys. It's June. It's the summer. Like, what just happened? <laughs> like, what? What happened? The schedule's just been so intense for me. Like, I don't know if you feel it, but it feels like this year's got away from me. Like